All right, today I'm going to focus on regional anesthesia for the upper extremity. Just first a word of caution. Anytime you partake in a procedure, you want to be fully aware of the things that could go wrong so you could recognize it and treat it. Now remember, there's a risk of permanent nerve injury with peripheral nerve blocks. This has been quoted at all different numbers, but the most common that I've seen is 3 in 10,000. You always have to remember that 12 or 24 hours of pain relief is never worth a permanent nerve injury. So if you don't have great visualization or you have a situation where you feel performing the block may propose risk to the patient, you want to abandon the block before forcing the issue and causing an injury. Pneumothorax. Anytime you violate the pleura with a needle, you'll have a pneumothorax. And this is why it's so important when you utilize ultrasound to have three things every time you do a block. You want to see your target, i.e. the nerve. You want to see your needle throughout the injection from the time you penetrate the skin until you're at your target. And you want to see the spread of the local anesthesia. If at any time you don't have any of those three things, you want to remove the needle, get your view again, and make a second attempt. There's always been some talk that regional anesthesia could disguise compartment syndrome. And there's been some work to show that this is not a risk in certain situations. But it is important to recognize that it is possible. And your surgeon has to be on board and understand that the patient will lose their sensorium and potentially could hide a compartment syndrome. So sometimes with procedures like a tibial plateau fracture, the surgeon will ask you not to perform the block, and it's important that we respect that. Remember that the nerve block is going to alter your motor and sensory exam. So if, for example, there's a tendon injury, make sure the surgeon has done his full exam prior to you performing the block. Total spinal anesthesia. So with the interscalene block, for example, the epineurium, as it becomes close to the neuraxium, will ultimately become the dural cuff. And if your needle is proximal enough, you could potentially have spread and cause a total spinal anesthetic. Or if you were to do a large volume block that were to spread epidurally, you could have epidural spread. Phrenic paralysis or injury I'm going to discuss during this lecture, but it's always important to keep in mind before you do the block, if the phrenic is at risk, will the patient tolerate phrenic palsy? If they're already relying on respiratory accessory muscles to breathe, and you take away the phrenic, which could be 35% of their tidal volume, you could have respiratory failure. Horner syndrome isn't really a complication. It's more of a side effect. So the meiosis, anhydrosis, and ptosis that can occur, for example, with interscalene block, occurs in 1 in 20 blocks. But it's important to recognize it because it could look like a corneal abrasion in the recovery room, or it could be troubling to the patient, and reassurance will let them know that it's just sympathetic, symp sympathetic block and will resolve. Patient falls is very important. If you're going to do a block that could cause weakness of a muscle, it's important you warn the patient. For example, a femoral nerve block will cause a 0 out of 5 quad muscle strength. And if the patient is not aware of this, when they stand up after their procedure, the knee could buckle, and they could have a fall. Even blocks like the adductor canal has been shown to cause some quad weakness in 1 in 20 patients. So if 5% of your patients will have weakness, it's important that 100% of your patients know that it's a possibility. And the last is the potential for local anesthetic systemic toxicity, also known as LAST. It's important for you to understand the medication that you're using and how it would present. For example, 
a drug like lidocaine will be more likely to present with perioral numbness and tinnitus and seizure versus a drug like bupivacaine, which has a different CV to CNS ratio, could be just as likely to cause cardiovascular collapse as its presenting symptom as it does neurological symptoms. Before attempting blocks, we really want to understand what our maximum doses are. We want to understand the toxicities that we can see. We want to really focus and become skilled on visualizing our needle in plane. Remember that our linear ultrasound probes have only a credit card thick width view of an ultrasound beam. So it's important to visually line up the needle with the center of the probe and then sweep the field with the probe to find that needle to make sure that the tip of the needle on the screen corresponds to the actual tip of the needle in the patient. We want to make sure we're skilled in airway management because if we have local anesthetic toxicity, it's most important to stop that seizure, manage the airway, and get the intralipid on board. So I'm going to focus on the upper extremity nerve blocks here. I'm going to start with the interscalene block, talk about the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, axillary, and also briefly mention forearm blocks. I want to give credit to all the images in this presentation. This one, for example, is from Netter. I have others from the USRA website, the NY SORA website, the LSORA website, Beagleson's Regional Atlas. Whenever I see a good image, I, I capture it and add it to these presentations. So <clears throat> here's a view showing where on the plexus each type of block that we perform is. So you can see that the interscaling block is at the root trunk intersection. It's not quite a root block, and it's not totally a trunk block. It's right where they come together. So when we see our traffic light on the screen during an interscaling block, that's not C5, 6, and 7. It's actually branches of C5, C6, and C6 again. So it's basically the intersection between the roots and the trunks. Supraclavicular is at the trunk division region, but it's more of a trunk block. The infraclavicular block is clearly the cords. So we have our la lateral, posterior, and medial cords. And the axillary block is clearly at the branch level. This is one of my favorite images. Um, you can see in orange the two muscles, the anterior and middle scalene. Coming through the anterior and middle scalene is the brachial plexus. And you can see on the surface of the anterior scalene muscle, the phrenic nerve. We can see in this plasterized specimen, the transverse cervical artery going right through the plexus. And that's why it's so important before you put your needle in the patient to put on the color flow to see if maybe one of the neural structures you're looking at is actually an artery. So if we click on the color flow and do not see pulsatile flow, and we don't have a compressible vein, we know it's unlikely that there's a vascular structure there. So this is just a nice view with the clavicle resected showing the C5 and 6 root, 7, and the 8 and T1 roots forming the trunks, giving off their divisions to form cords and ultimately branches. In the bottom left, you can see an image of a supraclavicular block being performed and how you can tell we're going to really focus on this supraclavicular area. Another reinforcing view that interscaling is a root trunk, supraclavicular is a trunk, infraclavicular is a cord block, and the axillary block is the terminal branches. We really want to be familiar with our brachial plexus anatomy. And this is a nice view to show the anatomy. So C5 and 6 roots form the superior trunk. The 7 root forms the middle trunk. 
and the A and T1 roots form the lower trunk. Each trunk gives posterior divisions to form the posterior cord. And the posterior cord gives the radial, radial and the axillary nerve. The superior and middle trunk give off anterior divisions to form the lateral cord, and the lateral cord gives the musculocutaneous nerve. The musculocutaneous nerve gives us our supination of the forearm, our flexion of the bicep, as well as the lateral antibrachial nerve. And we can see the anterior divisions from the inferior trunk will give us our medial cord. And the medial cord, and if you hold your hand in the anatomic position, the hand supinated, you can see that the medial side of the arm corresponds to where the ulnar nerve will end up. And that's how I remember that the medial cord is going to give the ulnar nerve. At the branch level, we have our musculocutaneous, our axillary, median, ulnar, and we can see some other important nerves here, like that C5, 6, and 7 form the long thoracic nerve, which is going to innervate our latissimus dorsa and be an important predictor or something we need to watch out for for a wing scapula. We can see that the lateral cord gives our lateral pectoral nerve, and the medial cord gives our medial pectoral nerve, and these two nerves are important for our pex 2 block. So let's focus in on the upper extremity nerve blocks. This top left picture demonstrates very nicely the deep cervical fascias. So we can see that our carotid and jugular are surrounded by the carotid sheath. That's one of our four deep cervical fascias. We can see that the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscle are surrounded by the investing fascia, another deep cervical fascia. And then furthermore in this upper left photo on the screen, we can see the anterior middle scalene with the brachial plexus in the middle, and these mm -hmm. muscles are surrounded by the paravertebral fascia. This fascia envelopes the muscles, and it's the pop you feel when you leave the middle scalene muscle to enter the interscalene groove your paravertebral fascia. On the right image, we can see the position we like our patient in when we do the supraclavicular and the interscalene nerve block, as well as the superficial cervical plexus block. And it shows all our important structures. We see our brachial plexus. We see our phrenic nerve on the interscalene. On the artery, we see the thyrocervical trunk giving off the transverse cervical artery, which goes right between the middle and inferior trunk, and would be a frequent time for vascular puncture without ultrasound. We can see our cervical plexus emerging beneath the sternocleidomastoid, which is going to give off important nerves for our upper extremity, like for clavicle fractures, when we talk about the supraclavicular nerve. a quick look at dermatomes. We can see our common dermatomal nose, but it's important to remember that it's not all about the skin in innervation. It's also important to look at the osteotomes. When you put a screw in the bone, a different nerve may be affected rather than the skin over that region. And so we'll discuss this at length. So the nerves we're going to be focusing on today. Now this is a picture on the left side of the screen looking from the front of the patient and on the right from behind the patient. We can see our phrenic nerve, which has relevance because the local anesthetic spread can diffuse to the phrenic nerve in many of the blocks that we do, including the superficial cervical plexus block, the interscalene block, the supraclavicular block. It is not likely to spread from an infraclavicular or axillary or forearm block, 
but we'll discuss this nerve at length. We have our supraclavicular nerves. Supraclavicular nerves come from the superficial cervical plexus and innervate the clavicle, medial two-thirds, as well as the skin over clavicle surgery. We have our lateral pectoral nerve, which is important for our pex block in a different lecture. Our musculocutaneous nerve, axillary nerve. And from behind, I want you to take notice of the supraclavicular nerves and the suprascapular nerve, which is a very important nerve for shoulder pain. Now the suprascapular nerve comes from the C5-6 area, so it's covered with our interscalene block. But you'll see techniques of just the suprascapular nerve, which are performed along the spine of the scapula to prevent phrenic involvement in certain high-risk patients. Looking at our skin, we have our supraclavicular and our axillary nerves, and posteriorly we have some suprascapular nerve. This is for the dermatomes. But the osteotomes, which are very important to us performing regional anesthesia, shows the extensive involvement of the suprascapular nerves in the humeral head. So we may always think it's axillary nerve, but axillary nerve is a big piece, but suprascapular is very important for the osteotomes, as well as the distal third of the acromion. So if we have a chromioclavicular surgery, the brachial plexus block will cover it because the distal third of the clavicle and the acromion are suprascapular, which come off of C5-6. But if we're performing medial two-thirds of the clavicle, we have to get our supraclavicular nerve, which is not a part of the brachial plexus, but instead a part of the superficial cervical plexus. really want you to focus in on the key at the bottom here and look at each nerve and notice the effect of suprascapular nerve on the humeral head. It's not just the axillary nerve. Now the vasculature is important because there are blood vessels that are in and around the brachial plexus. So here's a quick view of what is involved. So we have our subclavian artery and coming off of it is the thyrocervical trunk which gives off the inferior thyroid artery, the ascending cervical artery, and the transverse cervical artery. Now the transverse cervical artery as well as the dorsal scapular artery which comes directly off the subclavian can go right through the brachial plexus. So as I said earlier you want to put your color flow on and scan where your needle is going to go to make sure that there is no blood vessel for you to hit. Back to Netter, we have a nice look at all of the appropriate arteries and their relevance. All right, so let's get into the interscalene block. So interscalene block is for the shoulder and proximal humerus. That's it. You do not use the interscalene block for elbow, hand, or finger surgery because it is ulnar sparing. In the interscalene block, you're going to cover very well the C5 and 6 regions. And as we know, the lateral cord, which gives musculocutaneous, is C8 T1. So interscalene block, shoulder surgery, AC joint surgery, and proximal humeral fractures and other related surgeries. The supraclavicular, infraclavicular, axillary, and forearm blocks are for anything distal to the proximal humerus. So if it's elbow surgery, hand surgery, finger surgery, wrist surgery, supra, infra, ax, forearm. Now remember, the supraclavicular block can get the phrenic in 3 out of 10 patients. So what this means is if your patient cannot tolerate losing their, losing their phrenic nerve because they're already short of breath or if they have a big belly or for whatever reason, supraclavicular is not the correct choice because you cannot guarantee you will not involve the phrenic. So in a patient who cannot tolerate phrenic block would need either suprascapular or 
infraclavicular, axillary, or forearm blocks. Let's focus in on the interscalene block. You want to start at the supraclavicular fossa so you can identify your anatomy because the artery is easy to see. You want to hold the probe vertically in the supraclavicular fossa and find the subclavian artery. When you have the artery, you want to move your probe 30 degrees off the clavicle and aim it slightly up towards the chest and get the artery to be a circle because if the artery is a circle, and by that I mean in cross-section, then the trunks of your brachial plexus will also be in cross-section. We then paint brush up the neck. And what I mean by that is you start with your probe vertically, and then you move your probe horizontally as you paint brush up the neck to get a view of your anterior and middle scalene muscle, this is shown in the bottom right image, with the traffic light appearance of the brachial plexus, which is the C5 and 6 nerve, not necessarily roots, but where the C5 and 6 roots are becoming the superior trunk, so you see 5, C5, C6, C6, and this motion will allow us to, in plane, bring our needle from behind the brachial plexus, we will enter the skin, we will go through the middle scalene muscle, and we'll pop out of the middle scalene muscle into the interscalene groove. So the interscalene block is a nerve block where the needle is approached posteriorly to the brachial plexus through the middle scalene muscle entering the interscalene groove to get the C5 and 6 regions. Here's an image of the supraclavicular brachial plexus, which is mostly trunks probably, how it's described as a bundle of grapes. So how do you know when your interscalene block, I'm sorry, how do you know that the region you're viewing is interscalene? It's when your bundle of grapes turns into a traffic light. As soon as that transition happens, then you'll know that you have the superior trunk C5 and 6 region. And that's important because you don't want to miss the offshoot of the suprascapular nerve. So if we're too distal and we don't get spread proximally, we could miss the suprascapular nerve, which is our osteotomes to a lot of the posterior humerus. Here's a video showing the supraclavicular view. And he's going to paintbrush up the neck, go from a vertical orientation to a horizontal orientation, and watch the anterior and middle scalene muscle bodies form with the C5 and 6 roots. Forgive the circle, it's actually off, it should be to the left. Um, but you can see that to the, the anterior and middle scalene muscles, which are striated muscles, showing the C5 and 6 roots. Now he, here he went very proximal and saw a very proximal part of the nerve. You do not want that. You want to be more distal. So how do you know you're not too proximal? You basically move distal until it becomes grapes, move proximal till it's a traffic light, and stop there. This is a great bunch of images I believe I got from the USRA Regional Journal. And it shows the path of the phrenic nerve along the anterior scalene muscle. The anterior scalene muscle is in front of the brachial plexus. Now, before ultrasound, there were a lot of techniques where you use landmark and you dropped from the front of the neck to the brachial plexus, and there was a lot of phrenic nerve injury. The reason I included this slide here is to show you that you can see how easily diffusion through the paravertebral fascia could get to the anterior scalene muscle and cause phrenic palsy. You can also see that if you're going to come posteriorly through the middle scalene muscle behind the brachial plexus, you are very unlikely to injure the phrenic nerve. So keep your needle 
posterior to the brachial plexus throughout your block. If you put your deposit of local anesthesia posterior to the brachial plexus, it will spread by itself to the anterior brachial plexus, and you don't need to bring your needle to that region. So back to the phrenic nerve, a little minutia on the phrenic nerve. This is important for us to really understand. The diaphragm accounts for 75% of our volume during inspiration. Then we have our respiratory accessory muscles, our intercostals, scalenes, sternocleidomastoid muscles. They contribute the remaining quarter. There's little crossover between the right and left hemidiaphragms, and each can contract independently of the other. And in a healthy individual, after phrenic palsy, your tidal volume may remain unchanged because of the greater contribution to your ribcage. But in a higher risk group, so who are the higher risk groups? Patients with large abdomens. You know the bellies that look like a bowling ball? They have very low FRC, primarily because they have a low expiratory reserve volume. And when you have a low expiratory reserve volume, your closing capacity which is the point at which you have dynamic airway compression or shunt, could be in your normal tidal volume. So someone with a large belly could have a higher shunt fraction due to the low ERV, the small closing volume, which is the volume above the residual volume until you get to the closing capacity. And this could lead to hypoxia at rest. So if we take away their phrenic nerve, which bilateral phrenics account for 75% of their tidal volume, they could have respiratory failure. And how this would present is you would do your interscaling block, and 10 minutes later or so, the patient would get anxious, feel short of breath, and potentially need admission to the hospital, potentially need supplemental BiPAP, potentially could need intubation. And so our goal is to recognize who is a high-risk patient and do not do a technique that could affect their phrenic. So if I see someone using their accessory respiratory muscles to breathe at rest, I will not do an interscalene or a supraclavicular or a superficial cervical plexus block on them because I know that they're already using their accessory muscles. So if I take away their phrenic, I'll put them into respiratory failure. So who is this? The person breathing hard, They're, they have their hands tripoded to fixate their accessory muscles. You see their neck, you see their scalenes moving on normal breathing. And lastly, a very common patient, which is the very tight, large belly. If all of their body weight is in their hips and their legs, it's less likely to affect them. But if they have a large, tight belly, they may not tolerate the block. Another piece of advice is as soon as you finish your interscaling block, sit the patient straight up. Give them two liters of oxygen and tell them they might feel a little short of breath and it's normal and their oxygenation is actually normal. And show them on the screen that they have 100% saturation. Otherwise, their panic and anxiety could lead to a difficult situation. Just a little more fact here for fun. Unilateral phrenic nerve palsy after interscaling block reduces the FEV1 by 40%, up to 40%. So if your FEV1 is already reduced by a large number, you can imagine another 40% is significant. Now there is a landmark-based approach, and I put that this is a history of the ancient world because I will never do a landmark block again. I like to see my needle tip, I like to see the nerve, and I like to see the spread that the needle tip is not in the nerve, and that I'm having spread not in a vessel, but into the air I want it to go. Seeing is believing is my motto. But for an educational point, we would put our two fingers on the sternocleidomastoid and we'd walk off it laterally until we dropped into the interscaling groove. And the way you bring out the sternocleidomastoid is by having the patient push their head into your hand and you feel the giant sternocleidomastoid. Then you walk laterally until you feel a drop off and you have them sniff through their nose. And when they sniff, you can feel the anterior middle scaling. When you push hard, they'll actually feel their shoulder hurt because you're right on the brachial plexus.
Then at the level of C6, we take a 21 or 22 gauge two inch needle and we'd aim towards the spinous process of T1 in the parasagittal plane and we'd put our local in after receiving a twitch. We'd start our current at 1.5 milliamps and we'd lower it and make sure the current disappears at 0.4 milliamps. Because if there's no current at 0.4 milliamps, you're unlikely to be intraneural. Now I tell you this only out of historical purposes and I am not advocating landmark base blocks. All right, let's focus in now on the supraclavicular nerve block. So I believe this image is from Beaglesen's book, who is a regional anesthesiologist out of the University of Pittsburgh. And um, I just really like this gross dissection of the cad cadaver because it shows you what we're seeing on ultrasound in real life. So you can see from the bottom left image, we see our first rib. Above the rib, we see our subclavian artery, the large hypoechoic circle. To the left of the subclavian artery, we see our brachial mm -hmm. plexus, probably more the trunks of the brachial plexus. And then that hypoechoic area to the left of the brachial plexus, which almost looks like a vein, is actually the middle scalene muscle. And to the right of the subclavian artery is the anterior scalene muscle. Here's another nice dissection showing on the far left the vertebral artery. And we never fish our needle around medially because injection into the vertebral artery would cause instant seizure and a lot of trouble. We see our anterior scalene muscle and we see our superior trunk or the C5-6 root forming the superior trunk. Then we see our C7 root forming the middle trunk. And then we see our AT1 roots forming the inferior trunk. See our subclavian artery along the bottom. All right, so let's take a deep dive into the supraclavicular nerve block. This is a great block for AV fistula, for elbow surgery, hand surgery, wrist surgery. It is known as the spinal of the arm. So what do we do? We bring the head of the bed to 30 degrees. We turn the head up and away. We grab the operative arm and we pull it caudal to kind of open up the supraclavicular fossa so we have nice real estate to work on. We want to stand almost at the head of the bed but a little bit lateral so we can come in from behind with the needle and have lots of room without feeling crowded. So you want to bring your linear high frequency ultrasound probe against the clavicle. Now if you do that you will not have the subclavian artery in a cross section you'll have it in somewhere between a cross and longitudinal section. So you want to back the lateral edge of the probe off the clavicle 30 degrees and then aim the probe somewhat down so you can see the artery, the clavian artery, crossing the first rib. This will give us a view of the subclavian artery and cross section as well as the trunks of the brachial plexus. And this is a, a great histiologic section that shows what we're actually, what that bundle of grapes actually looks like under a microscope. And we can see there's a lot of stroma, or what might be known as the paraneurium, around what is contained the peripheral nerves. Um, again, they're not necessarily peripheral nerves, they're, they're part of the brachial plexus, but they are axons going to the hand, the arm, and we do not want our needle tip inside the nerves, the brachial plexus, because we don't want to have the potential to disrupt axons. So we want our needle between the trunks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what I'll do is start supraclavicularly with the probe and paintbrush up the neck and see the superior trunk leave the supraclavicular brachial plexus. Then I'll scan distally and I'll see where that plane is between the superior and the middle trunk and that's where I put my needle. When I put my needle in that space I will have the person injecting lightly give one ml of local anesthetic. And the reason I say lightly is if they were to press hard and be intraneural they can cause fascicular, intrafascicular nerve damage. It should feel like butter when they inject.
So you never want who's ever injecting to use two hands to inject. They want to use one thumb and it should feel easy. Now when they give this first CC, you want to watch the patient's forehead. If the patient grimaces as you inject the first CC, there's the potential that the injection is painful and you'd want to replace your needle in a different plane. Once that one cc is in and we see the superior and middle trunk separate, that is a good plane to put some deposits of your local anesthesia. Now it was initially thought that you want to go to the corner pocket, but you want to put your needle under the subclavian artery, inferior trunk area, but I think pretty good data has shown that as long as you have entered the paravertebral fascia and you're between the trunks, your spread will diffuse to get all three trunks. But I do make an attempt to make sure that I see all three trunks are covered. Just, just pointing out there is a certain topography to the plexus and based on what surgery you're doing you may want to think about hey hmm we're working on the pinky finger I want to really make sure I get the inferior trunk so I get the anterior divisions that go to the lateral cord that are going to give the ulnar nerve that kind of thinking here is a view of a supraclavicular peripheral nerve block we see that the artery is a perfect circle we see the plexus and we see the needle coming in plane. Now we have the first rib under the plexus there and the reason we know it's not pleura and it's rib is there's dropout below the cortical bone. So the needle, which is a blunt tip needle, is going to deposit some local anesthesia under the inferior trunk. This is a fairly aggressive block. You want to make sure that you always have your needle tip in view. And you never lose sight of it because you can enter the pleura. This is an example of the corner pocket. I typically put my needle between the superior and middle trunk to start to open things up. And then I'll redirect to make sure that I have all three trunks. Most importantly, we have spread on the field so we know we're not intravascular. We have no pain on injection, so we have a nice awake patient who just has some moderate sedation who would tell us if they have paresthesias or pain. And I personally use a twitch monitor to show that before injection I have no twitch at 0.4 milliamps. Because if I have no twitch at 0.4 milliamps, it is less likely that I am intraneural than paraneural. That was a look at the supraclavicular nerve block. Now the infraclavicular nerve block is a way to get to the three cords of the brachial plexus. The lateral, posterior, medial cord will give you the same coverage as the supraclavicular nerve block, as well as the axillary nerve block. The benefit here is it's very amendable to catheter-based techniques because the catheter can be taped on the front of the chest wall and is unlikely to be dislodged. It is phrenic sparing. And there are certain situations if there was, say, a dialysis catheter or something in the way in the supraclavicular fossa, or if a patient had a torticollis or something along those natures, that an infraclavicular might make sense. <clears throat> so I have Netter's picture here, which shows you the three cords. And pretty good data to show that if you put your needle tip in front of the posterior cord, between the posterior cord and the artery, axillary artery, that that one injection, 20 to 30 mLs, more like 20 mLs, would get you spread to the lateral medial cord. You can see at the bottom right a fresh gross dissection showing the pec major, pec minor, axillary artery and vein, the lateral, posterior, and medial cord. The bottom left picture shows the arm at its side, but it's better to be away to get a better view on the ultrasound. Here's an ultrasound image showing our pec major, minor, 
the lateral posterior medial cord, the axillary artery, axillary vein. And I like this picture from Beagleson because it shows how the artery and the brachial plexus, they grew together. So they're not separate entities. They, they are hydrodissected by you for the first time ever to make space between them. So your needle would go under ultrasound guidance behind the axillary artery in front of the posterior cord and hydrodissect the space. Some more views of uh, patient position, the three cords. All right, on to axillary block. So again, the axillary block will be phrenic sparing. Uh, it's very easily accessible. It's very superficial. Some of the problems with it are because you have to go at a branch level and you need to get musculocutaneous. You need to get ulnar, median, radial, as, as well as um, the intercostal brachial, if you're going to be working on the proximal arm, there's a little bit of a higher failure rate because of the multiple nerves you have to get versus, say, the three targets with the infraclavicular nerve block. Another takeaway is there's a lot of vein in the ultrasound view. And if you're pressing with your probe, you may be compressing the vein. And there are several reports in the literature of intravascular injection only noticed when the pressure was relieved on the ultrasound probe and they realized there was um, intravascular injection. So it's very important to see mm -hmm. spread of the local anesthesia on the field while you're injecting. And just like epidural anesthesia in obstetrics, we want interval injections. We want frequent aspirations. And we want to make sure we're not compressing the vein while we're aspirating because that could give us a false negative. And we also want to use the lowest product concentration of the drug. In other words, if we don't need motor block and we're doing post-operative analgesia, it may make sense to add some preservative-free saline to your 0.5% ropivacaine or bupivacaine to make a, say, a 0.375% solution because you're going to have a lower dose of the drug. And in case you have inadvertent injection, uh, intravascular injection, or even delayed absorption, you'll have a lower risk of lower anesthetic systemic toxicity. So here's a nice look at the anatomy. We see our biceps muscle, and we see that the coracobrachialis has the musculocutaneous nerve inside it. And so that's a separate injection. So there's two injections. The first injection is going to be by the radial artery in front of the conjoint tendon of the uh, latissimus dorsi muscle. We're going to get spread there, and then we're going to remove our needle, put it by the musculocutaneous nerve using a twitch monitor. We'll see the bicep twitching, and we'll do a second injection there. I like this image because it points out number nine, the conjoint tendon. This is a tendon that will give you um, great spread as long as you're inside of it. So we want to be behind the artery in front of the conjoint tendon, and we'll get great spread around the branches of the brachial plexus. So here's a picture of our needle tip coming to the posterior portion of the artery. And as we inject, we see the local anesthesia stays in front of the conjoint tendon but lifts the artery up, and we get spread that wraps around to get the radial ulnar and the median on the way out. And then we put our needle tip by the musculoskeletal nerve and do our last injection. I want to draw some attention to the intercostal brachial nerve. So as remember from our PEX block lectures, T2, so all intercostal nerves come around the chest and they give off a lateral branch which give off an anterior and posterior branch. Well, in the case of T2, the posterior branch is known as the intercostal brachial nerve. This is a nerve that innervates the medial upper arm and even sometimes the front of the deltoid. There can be a confluence there. But this is important for AV fistulas and tourniquet pain. So what we do is we take a 25 gauge needle and we inject 5 to 10 mLs of dilute local anesthesia from the lat to the pec 
subcutaneously, and that will cover the intercostal brachial nerve. Another option is the surgeon can infiltrate in the field because it's only a cutaneous nerve. It's not an covering osteotomes. So an example would be AV fistula. We would do a supraclavicular nerve lock. And then we would do a second injection on the underside of the proximal arm from the lat to the pec. 5 ml is a 1% lidocaine or 0.25% ropivacaine, whatever it is to get the intercostal brachial to cover the skin of that upper medial arm. Now another important point is that the middle scalene muscle, which our needle will go through during interscalene block, can actually contain the long thoracic nerve and the dorsal scapular nerve. Now if we damage the dorsal scapular nerve or the long thoracic nerve, we're going to have big sequelae. And this is one of the reasons that I use a twitch monitor for all of my regional anesthetics, even though I have ultrasound. If I see, especially if I'm doing a catheter-based technique and I'm using a TUI, if I see twitch of the shoulder blade corresponding to a density in the middle scalene muscle, I will change my route to avoid piercing the dorsal scapular or the long thoracic nerve. So I'm going through the middle scalene muscle to get to the interscalene groove. I don't want to damage the nerve on the way in. This is a high percentage in the ASA claims database after interscalene block is a wing scapula. So my advice is to not harass the nerves. Any regional technique I do I'm very delicate to put my local anesthetic outside the nerve and as I inject the local, the, the local anesthesia surrounds the nerve. But I try not to flick or puncture or go through a nerve. And I have the patients pretty awake. So I just use moderate sedation, which is some anxiolysis and some analgesia, maybe one or two of Versed, 50 to 100 of fentanyl because I want them to tell me as I inject that they have pain in their hand because if they do, I'm stopping my injection, I'm redirecting my needle, and I'm going to attempt to eject again. Now, as you inject, it should feel easy to inject, and the reason that is is because you're in the stroma between the neural components. But if you're in the fascicle, right, so our nerves have an epineurium, perineurium, endoneurium, if you, inside the fascicle are axons. So if you're in a fascicle, which is unlikely because we use very blunt needles. You know, the needles we use to infiltrate skin have a very low angle and they're sharp and they can get into a fascicle. But the needles we use for a, a nerve block are very blunt. And the reason for that is we want it to push the fascicles away. We don't want to enter a fascicle. Because if we inject intrafascicularly, we could have axonal damage. So if it's easy to inject, you see spread on the field, you don't see the nerve swelling, and the patient has no pain on injection, and add that to no twitch at 0 0.4 milliamps, you can document that you did a very safe technique. Because with a 3 in 10,000 risk of permanent nerve injury, you want to show on your record that you explained that there was a risk of nerve injury to the patient. And then under the performance of your block, you want to show that you did everything in your power to offer the patient the safest experience possible. And that includes low pressure on injection, no pain on injection, no twitch at 0 0.4 milliamps, great needle nerve visualization, great spread on the field. And these things will allow a juror of your peers to say, hey, listen, he had a bad outcome but he did everything in his power to minimize the risk. All right, so the dorsal scapular nerve gums down the medial border of the scapula and leads to medial scapular pain. So if you go through the middle scalene muscle and damage the dorsal scapular nerve, other than EMG, that's how it would present. And you can see in the bottom right picture how that nerve is in that muscle and it's very easy for you to hit. Then we have our long thoracic nerve. So C5, 6, and 7 comes down, innervates the serratus anterior. 
serratus anterior attaches to the underbelly of the, of the scapula, and you when you push out a, an arch, outstretched arm, that's with the serratus anterior muscle, that's when it works. So you'll see a wing scapula shown here on the left. There are other diseases that can cause a wing scapula, but after interscaling block, this is one option. Now, the long thoracic nerve can be damaged from mm -hmm. traction, which is frequently occurs during shoulder surgery. So it's not always shown to be from the peripheral nerve block, but that's why we want the patient in traction as little as possible, as little weight as possible, and to minimize the risk to this long thoracic nerve. All right, now the suprascapular nerve, remember in the pictures earlier, the suprascapular nerve has a tremendous osteotome innervation in the humeral head. And so if I want to make sure that I do not get the phrenic nerve, but I'm doing shoulder surgery, I may do a technique that puts a needle above the spine of the scapula where the suprascapular nerve is and put some 10 mLs of local there and I'll get pretty good shoulder coverage, especially if I combine it with an axillary nerve block. Okay, now briefly, the... Um, Cervical plexus block. Now, this is a block that you'll do for your awake carotids. This is a block that you can do for clavicle surgery. You can even do it quickly before um, thyroids, um, anything in the supraclavicular fossa. And basically, um, the position is you put the probe on the edge of the sternocleidomastoid. Now, look at the upper right picture. The sternocleidomastoid is labeled as CM. It's hypoechoic. And it has what's called the bird's beak. So the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid comes to a tip, and your needle is going to go right under that tip. It's right through the skin. So you're going to go through the skin, and you're going to feel a pop. And that pop is you piercing the investing fascia. The investing fascia, shown in the bottom left in brown, wraps the sternocleidomastoid. Then it connects the sternocleidomastoid to the trapezius muscle on the back of the neck. When you pop through there, you're going to put 10 mLs under the sternocleidomastoid, and you're going to get spread to all of the nerves of the superficial cervical plexus block. Now notice you're not entering the middle scalene muscle. That's the power of vertebral fascia, and you guys enter that all the time when you do an interscaling block. You go through the skin, investing, pop through the power of vertebral, go through the muscle, pop again through the paravertebral into the interscaling groove and do your block. That is different than what we're doing here. Here we're just popping through the investing fascia and depositing some local under what we call the bird's beak of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this will get you your supraclavicular nerve, which innervates the osteotomes to the medial two-thirds of the clavicle as well as all of the skin over the clavicle. I found this in the ER literature and it shows some, some other procedures that you can quickly pop this block in. I mean, this is the easiest block you'll ever do. Put the probe on, superficial, 10 mLs, boom. You can work on all the areas shown in these pictures. All right, so that was a look at the upper extremity nerve blocks. Now keep in mind you can do what's called forearm blocks. So you can, let's say you have a boxer's fracture of the fifth metacarpal, and it's just going to be a pin through the fifth metacarpal, and there's contraindication to other blocks. You may just go after the ulnar nerve in the forearm, not in the ulnar groove, because there's a there's risk to the nerve from the pressure if you do it there, but a little more distal in the forearm. So we'll approach that in a different lecture. But um, this is a, a look at the upper extremity blocks. And I just want to emphasize safety, minimizing risk to the patient, and offering safe techniques. Any questions, reach out to me via email. Thank you.